You're listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast where we introduce you to the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. Before we jump into this episode, we'd like to give special thanks to POP, peopleofplay.com, the one-stop hub for all toy and game inventors. Without them, this podcast would not be possible. You're listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast that introduces you to the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. I am artist, engineer, and game inventor, David Yakos. And I'm game designer, Branson Faustini, and together we get to interview the people who invented the world of fun. And today we get to welcome Matt Leacock. Uh, Matt was a full-time user experience designer working on products for companies including Apple, Netscape, AOL, Yahoo!, with a lifelong hobby of game development. However, in 2014, uh, he made his dream job come true. We get to hear about it a little bit. Uh, he's best known for some epic cooperative games, including Pandemic, Pandemic Legacy, Forbidden Island, and one of my favorites, uh, Forbidden Desert. Uh, he's coming to us from Sunnyvale, California. Thank you, Matt, so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, it's, it's really our pleasure. It's, uh, I'm excited to get to dive into some of... Uh, some of your games, some of the, the ideas behind them, and some of the theory as well. Yeah. yeah. As a, a lifelong uh, hobbyist game developer, where did that start? Were you making games as a kid? Um, what were the things that, that kid you was playing with? And... Yeah, I, I, well, I started out with, like a lot of people, just playing mass market board games, you know, Monopoly and Risk and, and Scrabble and that sort of thing. Uh, played a lot of aggravation with my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, I mean, my favorite gift that I would ever get for a, a, like a birthday or whatever would, would be a board game. And I just remember the anticipation. You'd shake the box and you'd hear, oh, this is a game. This is so great. <laughs> you tear off the wrapping paper and you get it on the table and you play it. And for me, a lot of the time that was always followed by this crash of disappointment because the games never seemed to live up to their uh, hype or the excitement that I had going into them. And I, I often just tried to figure out if there were ways I could make the games better. Um, so I would change the rules or you know flip over the game board and do something different on the back. And um, I was fortunate that my, my uncle liked to do this as well. So we, uh, my uncle Pat and I uh, modded a couple games together and he just showed me that like, Game design is something that one a person could do. You know, we'd spend like a day playing. Uh, we spent a day playing one of his steamboat games, and I just had the time of my life doing that. So it became a hobby for me, just tinkering with games. It's it's amazing how many uh, how many of the game inventors when they're talking about growing up bring up of grandma. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rummy cube and aggravation with uh, grandma B. Really yeah, uh, games have a way of kind of transcending generations and bringing families and groups of people together that. Now, you're not going to go out and play soccer typically with grandma, but you can play a little bit of <laughs> yeah. aggravation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so was that, uh, were there certain uh, things that you would do to change the games that made them more exciting? How did you make them more accessible as a, as a kid? Well, I wasn't looking to make it more accessible. I just wanted them to be more fun. I mean, I, the one that always stands out for me is a game called Invader which was essentially uh, some board game company trying to cash in on Space Invaders. <laughs> so every turn you roll to die, you moved your ship, it shot a, a, a baddie, and then that was it. There was no decisions in the game at all. So uh, that, that did not seem cool to me. So uh, uh, we flipped the board over and then um, turned it into like a, a game where you mined asteroids and, uh, you know, we're buying and selling from markets and, you know, running around and building ships and stuff and just trying to put some depth into the thing. Um, so that's an example of one, uh, <laughs> just trying to add some, some monochrome of interest. I mean, the games that I grew up with were not all that great. It, it's not like we have today, right? Maybe there'd be a half dozen titles coming out a year, it seemed, and some of them were really spotty. Now we've definitely got more to choose from with thousands hitting the shelf every, every year. But you didn't, uh, you know, start out your adult life as a game designer, uh, you were doing UI experience. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that and how that, um, I guess, eventually started to become part of your game development process? Yeah, I, 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 I want to say, obviously, I, I guess now these days you might aspire to be a game designer, but as a kid, that was like saying, oh, I want to be an astronaut. That's not, you know, <laughs> not a job <laughs> you think you're going to get. 
Um, so I wanted to be a graphic designer at first. So I, I studied that and then the web became a big thing. And so then I moved into interactive uh, design, uh, interaction design. And then the, the term for that kept changing. Eventually it became user experience. And it's all about like how the end user interacts with software and understands it and how they experience it. And you do a lot of research in that. Um, and you do a lot of iteration, you do a lot of prototyping. And so as I uh, learned how to do my job really well, I was sort of <laughs> also learning how to be a really good game designer, I think in, in the same time, because all of those skills are really transferable. Rapid prototyping, iteration, the research aspects, you know, being willing to throw away a design and try something new, not being happy with the design until you, you know, you actually put it in front of another human and see it, but see that at work. All that stuff was really great. So uh, I was able to kind of translate that into game design. Yeah, there's uh, definitely some of those things that I can see with like the rapid prototyping. Uh, if you're working on a game that you haven't uh, haven't tested, haven't done some you know, development, ha haven't gotten in front of other people and you've spent the last few years on it, before you finally show somebody, you're going to be <laughs> fairly disappointed. Oh God, I, I, I could feel like anxiety just <laughs> talking about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to get it in front of another person like right away. Um, I mean, not immediately. It, it, they usually spend a couple, maybe hours in a notebook. And then and then I've got to get something on the table that I can actually manipulate. And so my first audience is me. But after that, after a short period of time, I really want to get other people's eyes on it. Yeah, that you want to fail fast and fail cheap. That's the, uh, the idea there, I suppose. Yeah, I always want to feel like I can throw whatever I've got in the bin. And uh, so it's pretty important to be able to iterate really quickly and, and not get too attached to anything. Totally. So when you do have those ideas, though, like what is your your first thing you do to try to to capture that? Are you uh, building a prototype? You you mentioned your journal. Are you writing things down? Like what? How are you getting those ideas uh, into fruition quickly? Yeah, usually um, uh, they mull around in my head for a little while. Um, sometimes they're too ill formed to really even be able to articulate, and I'll just let it ruminate on them for a little while. But at a certain point, it's just too much to hold in your head. And then at that point, I'm often putting it into a, a paper journal just to just to get some kind of sketching down. And I've heard sketching is like a way to have a conversation with yourself. You know, you, you kind of have an idea and you put it down and then you look at it and you're like, oh, that's not quite right. And then you make a modification and you're going back and forth with, uh, you know, what you think you you know, and what you actually know, <laughs> something like that. So it's kind of rough and dirty and, and uh, messy and usually in pencil. And that doesn't last very long before I want to get it into some sort of digital format um, because I get frustrated when I want to do iterations if I have to redraw something over and over again. Uh, so the computer allows me to uh, really quickly make, you know, step and repeats and, and make lots of changes and look at lots of different variations and so on. And that generally gets printed out and thrown on the table. And the most crude form I can think of, you know, might just be boxes with type on them that I, I cut out with the scissors or whatever. Um, so it's generally like, a, yeah, like a pencil to um, journal uh, or illustrator, Adobe Illustrator. I do a lot of work there uh, onto uh, crude paper prototypes. That's the early phase. You can see your, uh, your computer experience coming through in your process. There's a lot of the artistic brain <laughs> people that uh, are all about the, the, the flowery sketch and that that theme in the picture, but I can see you flow charting these things down and uh, making a, making some spreadsheets behind it. If you if you're attacking spreadsheets, it. usually come later. That's usually around. <laughs> that one. Uh, but I have done like a little, uh, uh, I guess fl flow diagrams. I could, could I try to chart out the dynamics of a game when I'm trying to figure out like how does this thing work? What's what's that sort of like core loop and how does that work? Um, you can't go too far. Like if you go too far with that kind of stuff in the journal, it usually just dies on the, on the page. <laughs> but it can like help you sort out your, your thinking quite a bit. And you kind of figure out who does the player represent and what are they manipulating and what kind of effects might that have? And, and as you're kind of like fishing around an idea space. It's it's leveraging all the tools that you have, right? Like uh, all, all the experience that you have uh, through your through your life, game design, a user experience, graphic design, all of those things kind of come together and become a playground for uh, for invention, I guess. 
Yeah, you pick up all sorts of tools along the way. And I, I got to say, game design, uh, more than anything I can think of, is just voracious. It'll it'll take anything you can feed it, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, like behavioral economics some human psychology, some illustrations, some story writing, you know, you, anything. You can just keep tossing it in there and and uh, you can find a way to, to make use of those kinds of t- tools and ideas and techniques um, in, in your design. So it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. And, uh, and I know behind every successful game designer, there was another job <laughs> initially <laughs> as you're trying to, uh, to support that gaming habit. Um, yeah, I think for a lot of people, it starts out as a side gig just because it's, it's really difficult to make a living on like a royalty stream for a game that may or may not become a hit. You know, it's, yeah. it's really hard to feed a family on that. What was it like? What was that journey from... Uh, hobbyist to bringing your first game to market? Well, <laughs> that first game to market was uh, a story in itself. I mean, I, uh, I, I, all I wanted to do is try to get a game out there. I mean, I needed to, I needed to make something. And I actually printed off 200 copies of this first game called Lunatics Loop off of my like desktop printer. And mm-hmm. I went to a show in uh, Germany, Spiel. I had never been to Germany before, never been to the show before. But a friend of mine said, hey, you want to get a you want to get a booth and we can split it and we can sell our game. So I'm like, OK, sure. <laughs> so um, I uh, hand a, assembled, got all these pieces and printed out all the parts um, like locally on my desktop and shipped all the stuff over to Germany and assembled it in the hotel room and brought it to this this uh, booth in Hall 9. And this is something you wouldn't be able to get away with now. I mean, these games look pretty crappy. There was just- <laughs> We were assembling them in the hotel room the night before. <laughs> uh, well, we kind of assembled what we needed the night before, yeah. So I, I wasn't able to assemble all 150, 200 copies. I would, I would like to maybe 50 of them or something like that. And the boxes were like Kinko's like ream boxes with stickers on them. And the, the boards were laminated. Um, and uh, we had to take the, the bingo winks that were in there and like 10% of them were defective. So my wife and I were spending our summer like clipping them with uh, toenail clippers to get all the, the flange off of them. I mean, this is <laughs> it seems productive. <laughs> there are a lot of stories about this. Uh, anyway, uh, I brought them there and just just sold them and um, ended up actually losing quite a bit of money doing that. But uh, I met a lot of people in the industry that way, made a lot of connections at that show. And um also decided that I, I don't want to be a publisher. <laughs> I just wanted to <laughs> that was a really actually pretty inexpensive lesson really early on that I didn't really care about like making them, uh, you know, like manufacturing them. I, I really cared about designing them. And uh, I got invited, invited to uh, a conference there. I met Alan Moon and started to make connections and, and got good feedback on my next design, uh, which came out, I think uh, I started working out like four years later. Uh, but that was pandemic, and um, that was the first published design, first first one that someone else published, well, and that a, really it's a good jump from Lunatics Loop to uh, to pandemic. There, I'm assuming those first copies, those first first 200 copies or 50 are collector's items at this point. Yeah, you can still find them floating around. I mean, they're not like astronomically priced. The game was okay. <laughs> <laughs> People still care about how good a game is. So. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, so some of the lessons you learned in. In that very first uh, show, like what what else was like a big eye opening moment for you? God, I don't know. I mean, um, I look back. I, a lot of this is in hindsight. I look back at all the people I met at that show, and there's like a I had a, like, a little guest book almost on the on the on a counter, and people signed in or left their email address. And looking through those names, I didn't know those people at all, but I would come to know many of them. Um, so it was it was kind of a uh, became um, a fun routine really made or a fun tradition to go back to that show and, and meet the community there. Um, it's, it's a small community and, and, and they support each other. And that was one of the things that was really attractive as, as well as just loving games. I, I really did like the community that those shows, uh, present. That's one thing that the industry has that no other industry has is you get together with your competitors at the end of the show and you play games till two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's pretty great. That's pretty yeah. great. It's uh, it's interesting for you to, to even, recognize at that early point of uh, you wanted to be an inventor, but not a publisher. And I think there's different skill sets that come into play there. You get a lot of those creative minds that have the ability to put something together that has never been seen before, but the passion to get them boxed and distributed, that's a whole different uh, skill set or passion area. 
Well, I had a lot of that passion, but then I went and actually tried to do it. (laughs) (laughs) And then there was a recognition that, you know, I would end up spending a a ton of time doing that and not designing. And I really did like uh, doing the design work more than, um, you know, trying to figure out supply chains or, or, or what have you. So uh, it was it was good to learn that early. Well, it's, it's something that's nice about our industry too. You know, you mentioned you wanted to be more of you know the inventor versus the publisher, but the industry is set up to where you can be an inventor and bring an idea to a publisher and you know get royalty. Uh, and I love hearing you know your first your first swing at the plate is uh, the invention and the launch of of uh, pandemic, uh, something that. Uh, a, a game that has swept the world. <laughs> Maybe we can. Dive yeah, well, it was not little. not an overnight success. I mean, it, or like it, it wasn't like something I cooked up in an evening and and then just brought to market. Um, I, I developed that over I think three years, and I got a lot of um, feedback from just a tremendous amount of people, both like you know family and friends and work colleagues, but also like other game designers who played it and gave a lot of feedback. So. Um, I think the key thing there was just letting it incubate and developing it over a long period of time before it was finally ready. And then I, I, I brought it to a show and, and the fans or the, I shouldn't say fans, people who played it really enjoyed it. And they were bringing publishers to me. And that was, that was really great because uh, people were looking at it on, on its own merits because um, it had some, some buzz at that point. And yeah. And then it just, uh, it, it was released. And my, my hope was that, you know, we'd get a, a printing out of it and it would do well, maybe a second printing, but it, it was a bit of a sleeper hit. It, it just sort of uh, kept building over the over the next few months, and then started to build from there. Well, the uh, very first one of those, the uh, what did it initially look like? Because I know three year development cycle, it, it doesn't look like what it, we get at the shelf. What does that very first idea look like when it hits your journal or when it because? <laughs> Yeah, I want the I want the nitty gritty. Like how bad how oh, bad sure. did it start out as? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, early on, I was interested in a bunch of stuff. I mean, I, I uh, pan, you know, pandemics were in the news at the time, so two thousand four. So I think SARS had had come through, and I was really interested in uh, emergent kind of phenomenon, like really simple rule sets that could lead to explosive chain reactions and you know, like big effects. Um, I had done a game uh, when I was a, a kid about like being a particle in a nuclear reactor. And so the, it, you, you'd have these chips that would double exponentially. And I thought that was like fascinating. <laughs> so I wanted to capture some of this excitement in a game about fighting disease. Um, so I had a number of those ideas floating in my head. And when I came back from a walk, I, I sketched out a, a map on a big piece of newsprint. And it was just an arbitrary graph of nodes and lines. And then I labeled each of the nodes with a, a card, a unique card from a deck of like a poker playing deck. So you'd have like Queen of Hearts on, on one city and the, you know, Ace of Spades on another and the um, Three of Clubs on another, whatever. Um, and it just played around with um, using this deck of cards, some pawns and some cubes. And that's where I just through experimenting, I, I came up with this notion that you could take the discard pile in the game and put it on top of the draw pile in order to figure out where the cubes intensified just from kind of goofing around. And um, from that point on, I was really hooked. I could see how this could be really scary and intense. Um, and that was the, the key idea that kind of went through the, the whole um, life cycle of the, the game's development. It was all kind of hinged on that, that core concept. You know, dropping those, uh, those cards right back on top of the draw pile adds a bit of, a, a bit of anxiety. <laughs> I, mean, I suppose that's your intent. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was really like, oh, wow, this is going to really bump up. Uh, I could feel my heart beating like, oh, wow, these are really going to build up. And, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of things figured out. I thought maybe the cubes would just build up forever. And then I'm like, well, that's not going to work. So that's where the idea of the outbreaks came from. Like, I can't have an infinite number of cubes. So maybe I can cap that. Oh, if it reaches the threshold, you know, so you just, I don't know. I mean, I would never get that from sketching a notebook. I had to kind of like manipulate the pieces and kind of see the implications of the actions I was taking physically. So it's like a physical sketch almost um, uh, playing around. And uh, I think it's important to do that, that you can just kind of experiment and try really crazy, odd things when you're when you're playing around to discover things. Um, I think it's uh, unlikely that you're just going to like think of that and write it down and have this eureka moment. So for listeners who haven't 
played Pandemic. Could you give us a little <laughs> quick rundown of... Uh... Yeah, sure, that'll help. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so in Pandemic, it's a fully cooperative game, so everybody is playing together. Um, your, your goal is to find the cures to four different diseases that are like uh, threatening humanity. And um, so you do that by moving around the globe and trying to keep uh, disease outbreaks under control. You, you can move around and, and treat disease, which is like you take these little cubes representing the disease and pull them off the board. Uh, the problem is that the disease is growing in intensity. You're putting on more and more of these disease cubes every round. And so you really have to figure out how to coordinate with each other. Um, and you do that by passing cards to each other at various places in the world in order to, to meld a hand of five cards. And so if you can do that, if you can get one person to get the information, you know, in the form of cards that you need, um, you go to a research center and or station. There's one in Atlanta representing the CDC to begin with. You can go there, you can turn those cards in and discover a cure. So if you can discover those four cures before things just spiral out of control all over the world, then you all collectively win the game. So, so are you some kind of prophet? <laughs> 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 but, but seriously. Uh, yeah, I mean, back in the day, 2004 to, through 2007, whenever I was actually developing it, I mean, it's, again, SARS, it was, this was pandemics or something that happened that other people in other parts of the world, in my mind, this is not something that was going to happen to us. So when uh, COVID hit, that was just like, oh my God, that was really disorienting. Um, I gotta say, uh, but yeah, not uh, did not foresee this coming. As you know, knew that it could, of course, but you always kind of think, oh, that's that's someone else's problem. Uh, it, uh, the world definitely shrunk over the last couple of years, and uh, one of the things that I love about a lot of your games is you've got this focus on you know. The cooperative nature so versus uh you know one country destroying another country what we're doing is we're somehow working together to go ahead and stop something or to uh, some sort of cooperative goal you want to touch a little bit on the cooperative uh n nature of games and why why is it that you're uh, drawn to that i suppose yeah so I, I played a bunch of games here with with family uh, especially with my wife and um we just found that some games work really well for us and others don't. I, mean, I played a really uh, cutthroat negotiation game uh, with her one time and I won the game, but boy, I felt like I lost after that one. Um, <laughs> there, there are certain games that, 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 you know, work for different groups and some that don't. And we just found that when we played cooperative games together, we just really enjoyed it. It didn't matter who won or if we won or we lost because we, we had that experience together and we got to work together. So I was really drawn to that. I had played, um, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, Reiner Knizia's uh, 2000 uh, game. And that really opened my eyes that that cooperative games could be fun. Uh, before that, I thought they were like, um, I don't know, like exercises you would play at school in order to teach everyone that sharing and caring was important or, or that sort of thing. <laughs> and that they'd be dismissible. But, um, you know, that that design has so many great things in it. You've got this, this notion of self-sacrifice and everybody helping each other. I just loved it. And so I wanted to see, you know, could I could I do something like that? Um, and that really got me hooked on designing them. I found that I really enjoyed trying to create, well, I, try, I enjoyed like creating the enemy that all the players had to come together to fight. Uh, Cause it's, it's like, you're designing this little AI out of just paper and cardboard and, and trying to <laughs> trying to come up with an opponent out of paper and cardboard. That's worthy of like two to four minds working against it for up to an hour. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenging design brief. Um, so you but, come up with a, pand a, plan a pandemic <laughs> and uh, make everybody cooperatively work together. <laughs> How did the, uh, did the world take some, uh, some advice, you think, from the, the game after? <laughs> you had to have shifted global consciousness in some way with thousands and tens of thousands oh, of people. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I'm happy that you're fighting against the disease in the game. I'll just say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I wish the world had taken better notes, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not that guy who thinks that this is going to make this massive change in the world. Well, with but the yeah, uh, with the burden yeah, on the so many first that, responders, like oh, go ahead. Oh, with the burden on so many first responders in in real world stuff, you know, I love just that somehow you know that ends up being the characters of the game that are going through, and you know, you're working together as a first responder to try to stop. Uh, stop that uh, pandemic. It's pretty, pretty epic uh, as far as spot on gameplay. 
Are there yeah, I know people who are like in the medical community and so on who, or even just sci- scientists who are enjoy being the protagonist in a, in a game rather than like the Italian merchant or the, uh, you know, the, the axe wielding barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a scientist and I can save the world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice change. Yeah, it uh, brings in a lot more inclusivity for, you know, different roles, different, uh, different vocations, different passions. Yeah, I'd like to think it, it brings new people into into gaming. Uh, people who might be turned off by like fantasy themes or you know so many of these tropes that get get recycled so many times. For sure. How did that uh, pitch look? Uh, what did that pitch look like? Had you made a pretty polished prototype when you first pitched that, and did you pitch it to like multiple companies? You know, get denied a bunch of times. How did you get that idea from your head, your hands, and then to a publisher? Yeah, I had pitched the game to Days of Wonder, I think the year before it finally caught. And uh, just to show you how naive I was and how, you know, hindsight, everything looks obvious. At the time I pitched it initially, um, I brought it to the Days of Wonder offices at the time, which were not that far from me. And I put it on the on the board. I think they were interested in it because they, they wanted to see if they could do like a computer virus game. But uh, we played it and everybody at the time controlled gray pawns. Like you didn't have your own pawn. You're, you're all moving this collective set of, of gray undifferentiated <laughs> um, characters that had no special abilities and so on. And uh, one of one of them, uh, one of the founders over there was like, hey, you know, you might want to make them have special powers or like each person maybe could have their own pawn. I'm like, I don't know, that might imbalance it. That might be really hard to do. <laughs> Um, just to just to show you that you know these things that you take for granted um, are are not always obvious right away. So anyway, I took that back and I worked on it for another year. And um, I think by the time I finally did pitch it, I had a half a dozen sets. And um, actually, looking at it now, I think I had one set at this conference we play that got a lot of interest, and then I ended up mailing out five or six sets to different publishers uh, with instructions that you know I'm, I'm sending this to multiple people. And then Z-Man came back with a, with a great, um, uh, you know, like pitch and, uh, we agreed to, to go forward from there. It's a, it's an interesting journey for the inventor <clears throat> trying to go out there and the amount of rejection that, that a lot of inventors get and you, know, you get told no, or you say, you know, well, you should change this. And you get really tied into No, this is, I want a bunch of gray pawns. Like, it's nice, that, <laughs> it's nice that you were able to listen to that feedback and, uh, and create something that everybody can kind of empathize with. Yeah, I think it's important for the game to be um, in a good place before you pitch it. I mean, if it's only 80% of the way there, um, I mean, it, it, it gets a little tricky because uh, it's hard to know how exactly that last 20% will be done. I mean, I always feel like I want to have a game just about... Uh, done. Although that's changing. I've been working with a, a new publisher in another game, and we've been very much uh, working together through the last, I should say the second 80%. I feel like this 80% of it is the design work. <laughs> another 80% which is like developing and finishing the game. It takes 160% really effort fun. to launch any game. For sure. Yeah, I think that's right. And then you head over to the publisher and they do another 100%. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. So there's a, uh, with, uh, with, uh, pandemic in some of your other games, I know you've got some sort of give back where you're uh, trying to help first responders in some way. Do you want to maybe just share with what you guys are doing uh, with parts of those proceeds? I I love hearing. Oh, this. sure. Yeah. Um, I think this really started in earnest back when Ebola hit West Africa. Um, a friend of mine, um, Josh Becker, came up with the idea of doing a, a pandemic parties, uh, basically these events that would raise money um, for MSF or Doctors Without Borders. And we raised like $50,000 doing that, just getting people on just about every continent playing the game and, and um, donating. And I think it was maybe a little before that uh, or right around that time when my wife and I decided we would take uh, earmark 5% of uh, the design royalty for pandemic. And that goes right to MSF right off the, right off the top. So uh, we just been really uh, fans of what they, what they do. And it just, it seemed like a, a great way to, to channel some of that um, because it's so topical, so spot on, uh, their mission and, and sort of what the game does. Nice that you're able to not just change the world through play, but be able to connect that, those themes to, to some tangible way. Thank you for, yeah. thank you for doing that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I don't know. It just seemed like the right thing to do. 
you know, there's been some other trends that we're seeing in gaming, and I know you've been able to touch on this and set some set some of the trends with uh, with well, pandemic. Yeah, um, one of the first legacy games that my friends and I ever played was Pandemic Legacy, and that and a whole slew of other ones kind of came came from that. I feel as one of the the first ones that kind of entered the popular popular gaming uh the gaming mythos where where did pandemic legacy come from um yeah so um well obviously rob davio uh or maybe not obviously rob davio came up with this whole uh legacy concept with risk legacy when he was uh still at hasbro actually and that came out and uh just i don't know blew people's minds the fact that you could have a game that evolved as you played it uh making permanent changes to to your experience, every game affects the next one after that. It was a really compelling idea. And I had played Risk Legacy and it made a nice impact. Um, the idea I think came from a brainstorming uh, session with, uh, with Z-Man at the time. They were thinking about, well, where do we take Pandemic next? We had done an expansion and we thought maybe we could do a dice game, we could do a card game, we could do a legacy game. And uh, <laughs> when they said legacy game, I, I just kind of laughed. I thought, well, I, <laughs> that's more than I can take on. That's, that's a really big undertaking trying to do that. I was working at a startup at the time and I just couldn't imagine um, doing that. Um, but I, I think a few months passed and the idea was sort of in the back of my head. And I, I took out that notebook and I started sketching some ideas out and I very quickly filled up a couple pages of it and thought, Oh my God, this could be amazing. I got to I got to do this. So I got in touch with Z-Man and they put me in touch with uh, Rob because I, I really wanted to work with him on it, see if he would be interested. And he wrote back, I asked him, hey, you want to you work on a project together? How about a pandemic legacy? He just wrote back, yes, in like uh, <laughs> a PowerPoint type. Um, and yeah, then we just started working together. We worked together for, uh, I think over five or six years on uh, three legacy products. It was, it was a blast. That's awesome. Well, uh, what's... Uh... What's next on the horizon after, you know, you've got a couple of those you know, massive hits, you know, the Forbidden uh, series. I understand you've got something else that you're working on that's, uh, that's bubbling up that may, you know, may inspire people to change the world even further. I have a number of projects in the pipeline, but the one that I'm spending most of my time is a game called Daybreak, which is about uh, tackling the climate crisis. So it's another cooperative game where at this time, everybody's a world power. So instead of being like the medic, you're actually Europe <laughs> or China <laughs> or the United States um, or the majority world. And so you're all working together to um, roll out different policies and technologies to both draw carbon down to net zero while trying to protect your communities from uh, being in crisis. So if you can take care of the carbon problem and also protect your, your communities within you know in a certain amount of time, then uh, yeah, you uh, win the game. So <laughs> this has been different than all the other projects I've worked on in that uh, it really came out of the research. I wanted this to, be, to have pretty good fidelity, really represent the problem that we're all facing. And it was pretty personal because I, I was really having suffering from a lot of angst around this. And a lot of it was just not fully understanding what was going on. So I did a bunch of reading and went through a bit of a, uh, I call it like a trough of despair where I'm like, oh my God, what are we going to do about this? Uh, but I did end up reading enough to, to find out, hey, there are actual solutions. There, there, there is a way out of this. And part of the fun of the game was trying to figure out how to model that so that other people could kind of go on that journey, um, go through that emotional experience of seeing how big the problem is, but also realizing that, um, you know, um, tackling it is doable. And then like giving that experience to other people so they can actually experience that. And, and by playing the game, actually create a model for how to represent the problem and, and a way out of it. So uh, that's been really challenging and rewarding. I've been working with a co-designer in London named uh, Matteo Menapes. Um, we met on Twitter and just hit it off and been working for a year and a half on it uh, ever since. So That's cool. The, one of the things with a lot of like the educational or games or things where you're trying to have some sort of theme tied in is you sometimes uh, it, the, the theme sometimes fights with the fun <laughs> of the game. Oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I imagine that's a little bit tricky of making something that uh, has got like that, 
that game style, you know, addictive, like I want to come back and play this thing so I can save the world. Um, mm-hmm. and what's, what sort of ways do you find, uh, like how do you start to combine the world of play with something that is just such a heavy topic? Yeah, I mean, well, one of the key decisions we made first was that the game's got to be fun, first of all, first and foremost. It's got to be a game, and the game's got to be enjoyable. Um, and so that was, like, goal number one, because we could make a, a game that was educational, but if nobody wanted to play it, it wouldn't matter. And why are we doing that? We're just wasting our time. We're just making ourselves feel better. Or, you know, only the people who already bought in uh, would pick it up and maybe just to use it as an educational product. It felt like a much smaller um less, well, frankly, less fun thing to do. So uh, the key thing was trying to figure, crack into like, how can we make this enjoyable? So we ended up building out essentially a, an engine building game um, with different ways of cooperating. And we found that <clears throat> um, the stakes of it actually add a lot to it, right? There's <laughs> very high stakes. Um, <laughs> the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and then we found a, a really engaging core loop and a good way to represent the problem and a good way to, you know, it's like, almost 200 cards in the game. So it's very, very rich thematically. Um, and we're also involving a lot of uh, subject matter experts to like call us out if we're doing things that are, are um, just not representative or, or ignoring certain parts of the, the problem. Well, you've already so. proven yourself to be like this Nostradamus of gaming with these. <laughs> <laughs> no, just hopefully, hopefully in this case, what, you, what we're finding is like this, uh, we've got a generation here that will, <laughs> that will somehow save the world and make some better better uh, environmental choices. Uh, yeah, I would hope that people would play it and uh, see the magnitude of the problem and be energized to, to do something about it. Um, not necessarily um, in like a, I guess I, one of the messages of the game is really, it's gonna require big collective action. It's not just about you like recycling your plastic straws. So <laughs> we really <laughs> wanna show the breadth of uh, the problem and all the different ways you can approach it. Um, as you're playing it again it's it's not like spoon feeding you things it's you're playing a game you're really enjoying it and you internalize sort of like dynamic the dynamics of the problem and understand sort of like what the solution set looks like puts it on in the forefront of everybody's minds uh, yeah it's, it's a great way to like uh, uh it's a great excuse to to talk about it as well which i think is, is no small thing so um uh, before we we wrap up here is there some places that people w- could find or follow you, uh, follow the launch of that game or other places on social media? Yeah, uh, you can, uh, I've got a blog up at leacock.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Matt Leacock. Uh, you can find me at Facebook. Um, I think it's Matt.Leacock. And then if you're interested in Daybreak in particular, uh, it's uh, daybreakgame.org. Um, you can go there and sign up for a single one email that will tell you when the game launches. Um, I like the kind of sign up. It's not a lot of spam. It's just, okay, <laughs> here it is. The, yeah. The one you you is, we'll tell you that. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is epic. And, uh, you know, thank you for running through some of the games you've worked on and are working on. Uh, we will be back with you in part two, uh, for those that want to dive into some game theory, uh, from, I guess, some of your best practices and, uh, maybe some of the hurdles you've had to overcome. So thank you so much for sharing the games you've been working on. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This has been Hidden Roll, the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. If you like what we're doing, the best way you can support us is to share us with your favorite brains. Please thumbs up, leave a review, and follow Hidden Roll Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok. You can also sign up for our newsletter at www.hiddenrollpodcast.com for a monthly sneak peek at our upcoming content. That's Hidden Roll, R-O-L-E, podcast.com. Our episodes are available on all major listening platforms, or if you'd like to see our beautiful faces, all of our content is available to watch on YouTube. If you know of someone who would be a great fit to appear on our podcast, or if you'd like to learn the story behind any toy or game, send us an inquiry at hiddenrollpodcast.com forward slash suggestions. Or let us know on our social media. We love to hear your feedback and ideas. Once again, special thanks to Pop. People of Play, the one-stop hub for all toy and game inventors. Visit www.peopleofplay.com to learn more. 
This podcast is also made possible by the continued support of the brains who never grew up, inventors of play, Streamline Design. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.